Tonight's speaker, we have a very special group with us. Uh, they're Mark 9 Search and Rescue. We have Jerry Seavers and Gypsy. Gypsy's right here. You can see her nose right above the table. Uh, Chris Holmberg and Hope and Mike Holmberg and Faith. And before I get into the formal introduction, I want to talk a little bit about one of the projects we're trying to get going. Um, the Search and Rescue group is trying to acquire a boat from which they can do water searches and water rescues. And I believe that is there a specific depth at which one of your crew has been able to recover a body? Is there a maximum or? Well, uh, we, we did find one back in, I guess it was the late 90s, that was like 32 feet down. Wow, that's quite a, that's quite a yeah. depth. For, 32 a, for feet. a Texas lake, that's pretty deep. That's true. <laughs> that's almost under the dirt in, in a Texas lake. Um, one of the things that they need is they don't currently, as I understand it, have a craft that belongs to the group from which they can either do search and rescues or, gosh, I would bet there's probably a huge need just for practice and training to get the dogs out on the boats to make sure they're okay with it and get them to start finding specific targets before you actually have to go out and do it. So you, I would think you would need something serviceable that would serve all of those functions. That's correct. We're, we found a used boat that needs a lot of repair. And for the last, the team was begun in 1995, and we've never had a boat of our own since that time because we are a volunteer organization. We are a 501c3, which I'm not sure if we've been investigated by the IRS yet. But <laughs> <laughs> not that I'm aware of. Yeah, not that we're aware of. Anyway, but um, we've always, uh, I guess, Blanche Devereaux used to say, it's with our name desire. You know, we've always depended on the on the gifts of our friends. So we've always had other people bring their boats out and when we can get them to come out with us and it's kind of a hit and miss situation for the training purposes that we need. This boat getting it up and running and getting it to work for us would save us a lot of time and a lot of effort. That'd be good. Um, Jerry is going to be our main speaker but as you know we have Mike and Chris with both of their um, dogs Hope and Faith. Uh, Jerry is after eight years as a U.S. Army helicopter pilot, excuse me, stepped into the private sector in the field of surface transportation, where he spent 25 years in management. Currently, he is flying, or concurrently, was flying in the National Guard and Reserve in 2003. Jerry received license or certification as a barber and currently owns the Rogers Hotel Barbershop in Waxahachie. Very nice. His search and rescue training began as a helicopter pilot in Vietnam working with special forces in the location of missing military personnel. Jerry joined Mark 9 as a canine handler trainee in 1996 and served as a FAS team member in FAS? At Ford Area Support. Ford Area Support team member until his dog received certification. Since joining Mark 9, Jerry has also served in SAR Search and Rescue is a member of Texas Task Force 1 and 2 and 1st Special Response Group, an international search team. Currently serves as a canine handler and is the lead canine trainer for the Mark 9 group. Well, Jerry, let me turn it over to you. We'd love to hear anything about, uh, you know, gosh, how you might use um, equipment like a boat to do search and rescues. Why is that needed or relevant? Um, some of the recent things you've gone on, of course, a background on the group, wherever you'd like to take us. Well, the team was actually begun in 1995 by Max and Fleet of Cart. Max had been a, a uh, at that time, was a captain with the fire department and had gone to Oklahoma City after the Murrah building was collapsed after the bomb. He realized that there wasn't a team in the Dallas Fort Worth area that could do the work that was needed to be done in Oklahoma City. And uh, Mark 9 was officially begun in 1995 to uh, close that gap for the service of the Dallas Fort Worth area. It was called Metro Area Rescue K9 back then, and uh, that's where the Mark 9 uh, acronym came into place. Um, the team developed, and we do we do five types of searches since we started the team. We do uh, urban, which is the city type of mm -hmm. search. Wilderness is what you see in the movies all the time, yeah. out in the trees, <laughs> you know, which is actually what we did last week. And uh, we're still recovering. Yeah. <laughs> there is no Texas. 
Uh, we also do a disaster which is similar to the Murrah building or a tornado like the recent uh, tornadoes in Oklahoma City. Uh, we did respond to the 2003 Oklahoma City tornado in Moore and uh, several of our dogs were recognized for the uh, Canine Hall of Fame in Oklahoma for their work up there. And then we do what we call uh, water search which is the location of, uh, of drowning victims. And we also do what's known as cadaver, or cur currently known as HRD, human remains detection, mm -hmm. for uh, victims who have disappeared or may have been involved in a crime. We don't generally go out looking for bad guys. Mm -hmm. Our dogs are too sweet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we leave that to the patrol dogs. And uh, so uh, we take these guys out, and if they're looking for someone who's missing, they can find both live and dead. Mm -hmm. These dogs are cross-trained, which a lot of dogs are not, and we do that because our dogs uh, don't know what they're looking for, and we don't know what we're looking for when we first leave in a lot of cases. We hope, in this case, that we were out last week, we were looking for a dialysis patient who missed his appointment. The doctors began a search, couldn't find him, turned it over to the local police and sheriff's department. They searched for a couple of days and just wore themselves out and uh, we're friends with the uh, sheriff in Bowie County and I offered our services to him to stand down his team for rest for a couple of days and we were looking for this dialysis patient who was alive at the time but passed away while he was out there. Mm -hmm. So we started out looking for a live victim and we found a, a, a dead one in this case. That's unfortunate. And that's why we use cross-trained dogs, because uh, for the first 24 to 32 hours after someone passes away, they pretty much smell the same as a live person. But as time passes, the scent begins to change, and these dogs need to recognize that scent also. So they can divert themselves from finding live to you know, focusing on a cadaver. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that would be um, a crucial skill for them to have, because in a, oh gosh, if you're going into like the Oklahoma situation, the priority would be to find um, survivors first who might need medical attention and then I guess as a second sweep, the, the, those less fortunate who don't need the media. Well, one of the great things about search dogs and about dogs in general is, is that when they go looking for a live person or a dead person, they will find the live ones first. They will ignore the bodies. Mm -hmm. They will return to the bodies but they know the difference and they know that there's more of an urgency for the live person to get them in and get them out. And in case of, uh, of these dogs, like I said, they're cross-trained, so they'll find them. And even if they do find a body, they'll pass by it and go on to the live person. Right. But they'll indicate to us there's something there, and we may mark it and come back to it later. Sure. But sure. then go on looking for live people at that time. Well, I can, I can attest to one of our members' skills. <laughs> Faith there, um, just this is an, an amazing, just how good their noses are. Um, I'm a, uh, an avid outdoorsman, as is Mike, and we both have the opportunity to share some of that outdoors uh, deer hunting quite a lot. I can put on all of my carbon fiber scent lock clothing, clothing that will make me almost indetectable to a mature male whitetail within 40 or 50 yards of me, maybe even 40 or 50 feet of me, and she could find me 200 yards away, she could be moving what I would consider perpendicular to the wind, moving at a full run, and she would turn on a dime and come straight to me. And, and you know, a mature white tail wouldn't even know I was there. Well, one of the interesting things about German Shepherds and Australian Shepherds is that they are sheep dogs and they're used to herding. Mm -hmm. And a lot of Shepherds and these dogs will, in fact, basically herd you. They will circle you until they finally get into the point. They'll find where your scent's coming from and close that window. Yeah. Down right to the, and sometimes if they get that direct scent, they'll turn and go direct. But if they're if they're looking around and there's gusts of wind and everything else, they'll pick them up and they'll begin in their own minds focus and find out where that's coming from. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. these two guys, Case over here, when she was a pup, Faye or Hope over here, she was like a little rolling tank. You just turn it on and she just marched. <laughs> you know. And in the case of Faith over here, the one that found you, 
she was a little less focused at the time, <laughs> but she has become more focused as she's matured, and mm -hmm. she has never slowed down since yep. she started. You know, yeah. she is a very uh, active dog, and she usually leaves Mike sitting in the dust most of the time. He, he was panting <laughs> 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 a good bit. I remember that. To your defense. Yeah. And, and, and bless us, I'm a... I'm a uh, dog lover myself. Mine does that to me all the time as well. She can outrun me uh, easily. The um, what would a um, oh gosh a day training on the boat look like? Generally, we start anywhere from uh, seven to nine o'clock in the morning, uh, depending on the weather, and uh, we'll spend the next three or four hours uh, rotating the dogs through. And generally, what I will do is I will find. Uh, and these, these guys will attest to, I'm not real friendly when it comes to training. I hide everything as best I can and tell them absolutely nothing. And uh, I will take out a scent article and uh, place it in the water someplace, try to disguise it as best I could, because these dogs are extremely smart. And if they see something of a bright color floating in the water, they figure it out pretty quick. Yeah. But... Um, we will rotate the dogs through on the boats in and out all day long, taking them out and we'll run them out maybe a quarter to a half a mile and then turn back towards the direction we're looking for and then begin to use them as you would a, a, a needle on a compass. And as they get closer and closer, you can watch them move from one side of the boat to the other. And we tell the boat driver, whatever side of the boat they go to, you turn that way. Mm -hmm. And we use them and eventually we get them centered up on the front of the boat and they move directly over to the point. Now these two young ladies here, they'll begin to make noises as they get closer. Okay. Yeah. And the closer they get, and then you, a couple of them you have to be really careful of because they're water dogs, you know. Uh huh. Sure. They like to go after what's in the water, and the handlers have to make sure they stay in the boat. But they'll actually try to climb over the uh, the boat itself and yeah. try to get. And they'll indicate to you exactly where the scent is coming out of the water. That doesn't mean that's where the body is exactly. Sure. But it also it will tell you that, you know, we gotta start here and this is where we get and we'll get it down to a square of about ten meters. Right. And then we'll bring in divers after that to go in and actually find the body. Right. right. What could, do you team up with a oh gosh, a dive team or is it typically with the law enforcement? Well, if we're working with an agency, they usually have their own dive team. Mm -hmm. We also have some fellows who are a uh, dive team for the Dallas Fire Department. Mm -hmm. And Mike and his crew will come out there and help us out. There, we've been we've worked with them for over 10 years. Sure, or once upon a time, in many years. But I went through uh, rescue diver certification as well as dive master certification. Um, Mike, that, is, Mike's a, been at it, and is, you now he's got his daughter doing it with him. So. Oh, really? Yeah, so it's oh, a family that's, that's, affair. That's neat. Yeah, yeah, and that's one of the. And when you get these guys out on the boat, you know, when you first start out with them, the unstable surface of the boat is a problem, and. A type of boat that we use, if it doesn't have the flat deck in the front, mm -hmm. uh, can be a, a real problem for them trying to get their feet stable and trying to uh, sure. get themselves sure. in a situation where they can focus on what's in front of them. The boat that we have obtained, this, this used boat, has a flat deck in the front mm -hmm. and will allow us to move through the water, keeping them flat and being able to focus on what they're doing. Now, do you use like a... Um Oh gosh, an outdoor carpet on the, the front to help it keep is. the from sliding. Yeah, some water yeah. type of yeah. carpet, typical boat type of carpet. And we have to be careful with that, especially in the summer months because of the heat and the temperature on the floors. Yes. Yeah. You know, watch that. Yeah, yeah, that metal will get hot and hurried, and hurt, let it make hurt the pads. Yeah. Well, these guys are really good about what they do. They're very, they're very uh, capable of determining that for themselves. I, we had to laugh the last time because these guys were working really hard and this show off over here. We got in the boat and I mentioned to you earlier that it was rounded in the front and uh -huh. it was hard for them to stand and they were sliding all over the place trying to keep their, and they were still working hard. But this one turns around and sits down backwards. And this just kind of gives you an idea of how these noses work. She sits down backwards, we're going that way, she's looking this way, looking at me, and every time we cross the scent line, she barks. <laughs> and so, you know, she's not even looking in the direction we're going, and she, every time we, and I'm, what are you doing, you know? And she, every time we cross that scent line, so I said, well, every time she barks, 
turn the boat back that way. So we finally got her centered up that way, straightened out. Yeah. And as soon as we got close to it, she turned around and looked over the front of the boat. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, these guys, these guys can do it from any position. Those noses are great, you know. And I can imagine just Gypsy saying to herself, "Gosh, what do I have to do to get these humans to listen to me?" And that's that's stare weird. them in the face, bark at them, tell them where to go, and then here we are. We call it the dope on the rope look. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> they, they are they are notorious for turning around and looking at us and saying, I'm trying to tell you something here. In a lot of cases, they'll look at somebody else who's with you and say, would you straighten him out? You That's know, right. I bet. They I bet they do. Now, um, the, I, I would imagine the dogs, I mean, they're, they look like they're content and happy. Do they not have an emotional range that they might go through during all of this work? You know, it depends on the dog itself, and some have uh, a deeper emotion when it comes to it when they're looking for bodies. Um, after the, one of the th issues they found that when the Murrah building collapsed, there were no dogs who did that kind of work at that time. All the dogs that were brought in from around the country were basically wilderness dogs. Mm -hmm. And they never really spent a lot of time looking for a lot of bodies in one place. And a lot of the dogs quit working while they were there and they couldn't figure out why and it took a while for several of the handlers up there to realize that these dogs began to have depression issues looking for multiple dead bodies at a time uh, and it became uh, concerned all of them you know how do we get them out of this mm -hmm. And we have found there's a very simple solution to this thing that's just really unique and that is let them find a live person. Yeah. And so when we train these dogs, whether it's on the water or whether it's on land, if we train them all day long looking for bodies, at the end of the day, we turn around and, you know, it's, it could be as simple as going 20 feet and hiding behind a car. Sure. And they'll go down there, find the person, you see that old tail just go into town again, you know, and they're fine. That's happy because that's what they like to do. They like to find the live people. And that, in Gypsy's case, you know, she just doesn't care. It doesn't bother her. And she's a very, what I would call, a low emotion. Mm -hmm. You know, she has, she, the, the, the thing doesn't bother her. Some dogs, you have a high emotion case where it really, they really focus on the depression part, of it, and it takes a while to get them out of it. My first dog, I had to pull from a search one time because uh, she did get so uh, depressed that she quit work. Mm -hmm. And it took me three months to get her straightened out. So it's, it, it can happen. You know, even though we went through all the, the proper procedures to get her out of it, and it took her a while, but she finally got back to work doing it again. And Good. She, she was happy to do it. Neat. But these guys are these guys. Once they once they find the uh, once they find the body, they're happy to, to, to found because they're trying to please their handlers. Right. You know, and that's of what course. they're that's what they're doing, and they they know that they're going to be rewarded for finding what they're supposed to do. So. Hey. They're all sweethearts. They're all family dogs. Yeah. Uh, these guys all live with us. You know, they are not like police dogs. In most cases, they may be kenneled up someplace or a military dog. And uh, these guys come home with us. And that's why we say we don't generally search for bad guys because, yeah, you know, they're not aggressive. They're very socialized. They play with kids all the time. They mm -hmm. play with adults. And they would walk up to somebody and just sit down in front of them. Like when we came in, they're very happy to see everybody and play yeah. with them. Yeah, they were, they were quite... Like the great great grand kids of a, a and two month old here that they just well, gently I, nosed up to and didn't even don't even approach quickly. Yeah, I mean they're one of the really neat things about them is when we're on site, uh, maybe on a water recovery, uh, they can almost pick out who the families are. Hmm. And I've had more than one or two of them just go sit with them, you know, hmm. because they know these people are under duress. And they will just go over there and sit with them and let them pet them. That's, <clears throat> that's me. The um, uh, we're certainly hoping that we we can help uh, facilitate some of the boat, but I would imagine you probably have uh, other needs too. I know Mike has asked me a lot of times to come on Saturdays and Sundays and hide in buildings and places like that and be a volunteer. What types of things, if anybody wanted to go out and and just watch them work or help, uh, is available? Well, we, we train almost every weekend, and we train for three or four hours, and we're always in need of what I call fresh scent, mm -hmm. <laughs> or fresh meat as we use this. But fresh scent because, you know, these dogs get bored with finding us. Yeah. 
I mean, oh, it's it, you. Yeah, <laughs> that's usually what you get. You know, and and and, and these are the ones who have been doing it for a while. You know, if if um, they know who they're looking for, it takes a lot longer for them to find. Them. <laughs> yeah, you know they know what's going on. Oh, he's so lost gonna, again. Uh, Never mind. Yeah, we know him. He's okay. I'll find him when I get there. You know, <laughs> and uh, so the people who would come out and help us would really give us a, a really great benefit in the fact that they've got somebody new to search, new mm -hmm. search for. And we had a case last week, and we had a couple of gentlemen out there. And the first thing we did is we call it a sense-specific problem, and that is where we give them an article of clothing and tell them to find just that person. Mm -hmm. And we'll have the two individuals walk out and then split trails. Yeah. And uh, it's you know you can't fool them. You know they get a little a little whiff of that scent that you give them, and the next thing you know, the guy one the guy who was not the scent article uh, person wanders off, and he gets left alone. Mm -hmm. Now they may go look for him after they have found the other person because we'll tell them to find more, and they'll go find him then. Mm -hmm. So they have a general idea where he is, and they'll pick up his scent. But they'll find the sense specific person first, and so, you know, if we have people there we can do that with, rather than just us all the time, it really makes a huge difference. Property is another thing that we need. locations. Uh, they get tired of doing the same buildings, the same facilities, it's everything. Sense, yeah. If somebody has a, a tract of property someplace, you know, if, if, if there's nothing on it or there's buildings on it, you know, and they don't mind. Uh, we'll take these guys out there and let them work out there to give them something different to do. Mm -hmm. Every every little possible uh, different scenario you can give them to increase the the uh, difficulty of the problem is nothing. It, it makes their day. Right. Right. Because now they now they've got something to do that, that really deserves their effort. Yeah. And they'll put it out there for them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, dogs oftentimes I think are smarter than us in many things. And I, I guess it's very accurate when you say they, they turn around and look at the dope pulled in the leash and, okay, how come you're not up here with me? I'm already there. Why don't you recognize the same thing I know? Well, we, this case we had last week, it was fun to watch them work out in this heavy brush. But they're, again, they, they get us to do the work for them. The brush was so heavy and so <laughs> laden with thorns and everything. Yeah. You know, they actually let us break the way for them, and then they, you know, they'd fly through and use their nose when they could. Is More that proof that they're smarter than us. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? We'll go ahead and sign off. We're going to end with uh, reciting the four-way test of rotary, which is the four-way test of the things that we think, say, or do. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone. Our meeting is adjourned.